Welcome to the Vice Chancellor's Talking Anti-Racism webinar series hosted by Cardiff University. The project is led by Michelle Alexis from the Vice Chancellor's office. Over two years, we'll have a, a series of talks opening discussions on anti-racism in different schools and departments. It's important that we have open discussions on this topic from the perspective of different disciplines. My name is Deepak Ramji, and I'm Deputy Head of School of Biosciences at Cardiff University. I will chair a panel that includes Jim Murray, who is Head of School of Biosciences. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Daniela Riccardi, who is former Deputy Head of School of Biosciences. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Daniela. And Numer Masood, an early career researcher in the school. Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Thanks, Numer. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker, Pawin Yakub. Pawin is Professor of Nutritional Physiology, a Deputy Vice Chancellor and Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at University of Reading. She's also chair of the Athena Swan Governors Committee. And the title of her talk is the one with the foreign sounding name. Pawin, many thanks for agreeing to give this webinar. We've been waiting for months to hear your talk. I will allow screen sharing so you can get started when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Deepak, and for inviting me to talk in your Talking Anti-Racism series. I think what you're doing in terms of opening up frank and honest conversation sets a really positive example, and I'm really honored to be part of that. So I'm just sharing my screen now. So I guess I should start by explaining the title that I've chosen. It comes from a conversation I had with a colleague a few years ago who was struggling to remember the name of someone. She racked her brains for a bit, and then she said, it was a foreign sounding name. And I remember hesitating and just stopped myself from saying, you mean like mine? Foreign is one of those words that feels okay when you use it to describe policies or in reference to the foreign office, but there is always something a bit uncomfortable for me anyway about referring to a person as foreign. And in fact, sociologists have shown that having a foreign name can influence your prospects in life. So if you send identical pairs of CVs to prospective employers, with the only difference being that one has a traditional British sounding name and the other has an ethnic name, the British sounding name always receives more favorable responses, despite the fact that the qualifications and experience might be exactly the same. And in the UK, we know that minority ethnic applicants have to send something like 60% more applications to get a job interview than their white counterparts. When my sister moved to Norwich recently as a mature student, she really struggled to find any accommodation. Every time she rang to look at a flat, she'd give her name and the estate agent would tell her it had gone. But she later found out that some of her classmates had been shown the same flats, even though they'd called several days later. And in higher education, there's mounting evidence to suggest that having an ethnic name lowers your chances of winning research funding, increases the likelihood of having your papers rejected. So actually having a foreign sounding name does have consequences. And my title is also a bit of a cheeky nod towards the 90s sitcom Friends, where every episode was called The One With The. Of course, there never was an episode called The One With The Foreign Sounding Name, but it's not really a joke when you consider that the show was heavily criticized for its total lack of diversity. And even its producers now say that they would have done things differently. So today I'm going to share a frank account of my childhood as a second generation British Pakistani in 70s and 80s South London, of university in the late 80s and an academic career spanning 30 years. And I'm going to talk about how my lived experience shapes some of the work that I do today, including a race equality review at the University of Reading. And I'm speaking, I guess, from a particularly unique perspective of a female ethnic minority university leader who's been through the British education system. So I guess it makes sense to start at the beginning. I was born in South London, middle of five children to parents who were immigrants from Pakistan. 
my dad was a bus conductor and when he first arrived in the UK and had um, when he first arrived in the UK but once he'd saved enough money he bought a shop called Nagina which means gem and it was one of the earliest of those shops that sells Asian foods and halal meat and it quickly became the heart of a small community. Our customers uh, were like aunts and uncles and there was always someone having a cup of tea and a samosa and a chat at the back of the shop. But after about 10 years or so of running the shop, my dad sold Nagina and decided that he was British enough to buy the fish and chip shop across the road. But three days after opening, a man walked in and said, we don't want Packies running our fish and chip shop and walked out again. And there was a local campaign against us, mainly graffiti, but often broken windows. And dad had to sell the shop after just a few months. Now, if you're a person of color who grew up in the 70s and 80s, that's not in any way an unusual story. It was completely normal for us to experience racist abuse in the streets, to come home from school, to find racist graffiti all over the front door and to have my bedroom window smashed while I was sitting at my desk doing my homework one evening. But I guess if you didn't grow up with that experience, even then you can imagine that it would have an impact on the way that you interact with people, the extent to which you're willing to trust people, how you are around strangers or in unfamiliar places, how likely you are to put yourself in situations outside your comfort zone, and actually how likely you are to want to even make yourself visible. Because by being visible, you risk being targeted. And I remember when I was young, I would go to great lengths to make sure that I didn't look too visible when I went out. And yet now, all these years later, when people like me are underrepresented in many parts of society, visibility seems to be everything. So when we think about the barriers for underrepresented groups to take on visible roles, we rarely stop to think about how their lived experience might play a role in creating invisible barriers for them. And I think unless we're prepared to recognize that and do something about it, we're turning our backs on huge amounts of untapped potential. So I went to a multiracial state school for most of my life. It really suited me. I've always been most comfortable in a diverse environment. But at that school, the standard of teaching was pretty appalling and the unexpected closure of the school and then a sequence of events that followed that led me to getting a free place in the sixth form of a very white middle class private school in 1985. And that was a total culture shock. I felt totally out of place. But once I got used to the idea, I decided I wasn't going to waste the opportunity. And so I asked the school if I could join the Oxbridge track to apply for a place at Oxford. I was told that it was normally the school's decision about who did or didn't join the Oxbridge track. And if you just think about that for a minute, so in order to be in a position to apply to Oxbridge, you'd pretty much in those days anyway, have to be at a private school. And then you had to be one of the chosen ones. But anyway, I decided to ignore that. And I started turning up at the lunchtime lessons, took the exams, did the interviews, and was eventually offered a place at Oxford to read physiology. I was amongst the first generation of children born to immigrant parents who had the opportunity to go to university. Um, my experience of being an undergraduate was probably bittersweet because there was a lot of positive, but experience of racism wasn't ever that far away. I had a friend who at the end of the first year apologized for not being able to invite me to her home during the holidays because her parents, she said, were openly racist. And so I was the only one out of our group who didn't go. I remember actually feeling sorry for her at the time, thinking the poor thing, having to put up with racist parents. But then when I shared a house with her in my second year, I realized that the apple didn't fall far from the tree. I was subjected to sustained racist bullying, not just by her, but another housemate. And it got so bad that someone anonymously reported it to the college and they offered to move me out. I couldn't afford that because I had a 12 month contract. So I stayed put and by the end of the year, my mental and physical health was in pieces. She actually wrote to me to apologize years later and we ended up sitting next to each other at a reunion dinner about five years ago. We laughed a lot, it was really very healing. But I remember a friend turning up one evening to get me out of that awful house because he knew what a hard time I was having. And we went to a local pub for a drink. At the pub, the landlord put our drinks on the counter, looked at my friend and said, does she want curry powder in hers? 
Now, when racism is avert in that way, it's absolutely clear that you're being treated in a particular way because of your skin colour. It's generally not like that now. So over the last two years, I've been leading a lot of race equality work at Reading. I'll talk about that in more detail later. But it is clear that today there's much more subtlety and nuance. And it often leaves individuals going over things repeatedly to try to work out why they were treated or spoken to in that way. And instead of making them more resilient, it actually builds up over time and has an impact on mental well-being. Now, while I'm talking about my university years, I do want to mention the awarding gap. So this is the difference in the proportion of one group receiving a first or a two one as their degree outcome compared with another group. You probably know there's a stubborn awarding gap in higher education between black, Asian and minority ethnic students and white students. And it's most stark for black students when you disaggregate the data. Most universities have plans to address their awarding gaps. And in the past, a lot of them have been based on actions that focus around mentoring and support for the minority groups to get them up to the same level as their white peers. The approach has sometimes been criticised as deficit model because it's based on the assumption that the awarding gap is due to a deficit in the minority group that needs to be addressed. But I want to tell you a personal story that illustrates how the awarding gap is not necessarily about a deficit or even about fair marking. So I was a final year undergraduate in 1990 and I'd chosen to do an optional module on endocrinology, which is the study of hormones. I was scheduled to have tutorials every week with a tutor who was a specialist in the subject, as was normal. As I settled down for the first session with my tutorial partner, I noticed that the tutor was staring intently at the London Against Racism badge on my rucksack. About 10 minutes into the tutorial, he used the N word in a phrase that was a metaphor for a particularly annoying problem, in this case in biology. And he did it slowly and deliberately, watching me for a reaction. I was so shocked that I found it hard to concentrate on the rest of the tutorial. And when we left, I asked my tutorial partner if we should report what had happened. She, to my surprise, insisted that she didn't think he'd meant it in a racist way at all. So she was a mature student in her 40s and I'd thought of her as a friend. So I was just as upset about her reaction and lack of allyship as I was about what had happened. So I didn't report it. And as the term went on, the tutor became more patronizing and unpleasant. Everything I said was met with a sneer. And eventually I pretty much stopped saying anything. I left most of the talking to my tutorial partner and just started to become disengaged from the subject. At the end of the term, my personal tutor at my college was really surprised to receive a negative report on my performance that criticized my lack of engagement. So I told her what had happened. She said she was sorry to hear that and that she'd also previously had complaints about his attitude to women, but he was the only specialist in that subject and she wasn't sure there was anything they could do. Looking back on it now, I suppose I should be glad that the tutor had flagged his racism so clearly in that first tutorial, otherwise I might have spent the term wondering whether there was something wrong with me. Anyway, in the short term, the impact was that the college ignored his report and they awarded me the college tutorial prize for the second year in a row, but I got a lower mark than I expected or than was expected for endocrinology that year. And that year, almost every one of the students who got a first were white and male. And if you think about the longer term impact, well, whenever I see or hear the word endocrinology, the first thing I think of is that tutor, what he said and the way he made me feel. So you can imagine how the students we teach today will talk about us in 30 years time, just as I'm talking about that tutor today. And the point is that the awarding gap isn't just about fair marking, it's about the way that you make a student feel the minute they walk through the door. And I do wonder what, the outcome of an incident like the one that I've described would be like today, if it happened today, would there be an investigation that resulted in the tutor being sacked or with the fact that he was a world expert in parathyroid hormone coming to play, or perhaps I'd be offered a settlement and asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement. So moving on, I started my academic career at Reading and I've been there for nearly 24 years. It's been really good to me and I've been really fortunate to have had some incredibly supportive mentors. But that doesn't mean that there haven't been times when I've been reminded that I fall into the other category. 
So some years ago, I had lunch with two very senior figures in the university, during which one of them spoke about a lecture that he'd delivered the previous evening. He described looking out at a sea of faces and remarked that not a single one was British. I resisted the temptation to ask him what exactly he thought a British face looked like. And at a conference in London recently, I was a plenary speaker and unusually there was another female Asian speaker on the program, despite the fact that we didn't look anything like each other. Two top participants mistook her for me during the coffee breaks. It was as if they couldn't see past our skin color. And while that might seem like a minor mistake, I think there are far reaching implications. What's the likelihood, for example, of either of us being invited to speak elsewhere or to do something prestigious if the only thing that people can remember about us is that we were brown? People of color often talk about two particular challenges in the workplace. One, having to work twice as hard to prove their worth and two, being subjected to extra scrutiny compared with their peers. And I think I've experienced some of both. So if I'm invited to sit on a panel or offered a prestigious opportunity, a small part of me will wonder whether I'm there to fill a diversity quota. And then I'll usually work twice as hard to prove that I deserve to be there on the basis of my ability. A few years ago, I was put forward for a role that was particularly high profile. And the person who had nominated me had complete confidence in my ability, but he needed approval from someone in a higher position. That approval didn't come straight away. I was told that the approver felt that he hadn't seen enough of me yet and couldn't quite see me in the role. So I was asked to wait for another six months while he considered. And in the meantime, I was advised to make sure that I was visible and to prove that I was worthy of the role. Eventually I did get, get the role. And a year later, that same approver wrote to me personally to tell me what a wonderful job he thought I was doing. So I'm left wondering whether the alternatives who happen to all be white and male would have been subjected to the same additional scrutiny that I was. This report just published by the Black Women in Leadership Network suggests that almost 70% of Black women surveyed had experienced racial bias at work, with most common experience being paid less attention, being more likely to be doubted on a matter for which they have responsibility and being addressed in an unprofessional way. And Black women who were senior executives reported the most discriminatory behaviour. 33% of Black women surveyed had resigned from a position because of unfair treatment, and that rose to 52% for those in a senior executive position. I think that's shocking data, and it speaks of institutional racism. So are universities in the UK institutionally racist? Well, the Vice Chancellor from the University of East Anglia, David Richardson, who also authored a university's UK report on racial harassment thinks so. He cites, just as one example, the um, case of the Manchester student who was racially profiled by security office, officers during the height of the pandemic and says that concerns around reputation are holding universities back from acknowledging and addressing the issue properly. I think it's easy to be trapped into thinking that the term institutional racism is just about policy and process, but there's a definition, the Lawrence definition developed in 1999 that tells us that it's actually much more than that. It describes institutional racism as a collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. And it says that it happens through prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racial stereotyping, which all disadvantage minority ethnic people. I've talked about my own experiences. So from the way that I was treated by peers and tutors and local people as a student, to the subtle but also pervasive biases that I've encountered as an academic and even as a senior university leader. Every part of my university experience will have been slightly different from that of my white peers. And I think that's largely still the case today. Is that okay? I don't think it is. The heightened awareness of racial inequalities in the spring of 2020 after the murder of George Floyd prompted many universities, including ours, to publish statements of solidarity and a commitment to anti-racism. And there was a degree of cynicism about those statements. I remember seeing a lot of articles that summer asking why people were suddenly so interested in racism when black people have been struggling with it for their whole lives, often to the point of exhaustion. Why is it 
that of the 19,000 or so professors in the UK, only about 30 are black women. Why is there a stubborn pay gap between black and white academics doing the same jobs and a stubborn awarding gap between black and white students, even after prior attainment has been taken into account? So like many other universities, we had already made efforts to address racial inequalities with varying levels of success. We'd set race equality targets that were not met. We knew there was a feeling that race and ethnicity were carefully ignored and rarely discussed outside the narrow reference frame of equality, diversity, inclusion. But we knew also that there was a strong desire amongst many to have meaningful discussion about racism in a safe environment. So it was in June 2020 that we launched our Race Equality Review with the aims of listening to reflections on race and racism and understanding experiences of racial inequality, of normalizing discourse about race by engaging staff and students, of evaluating our current position against existing measures of race equality, understanding why we're struggling to meet our race equality targets and identifying actions for improvement. Our approach was to conduct the review in four phases. So we began with a listening phase that involved focus groups, and we then built on that by conducting a survey of staff and students. We also set up an electronic wall where people could post comments and questions and hosted live panel discussions. And we then combined what came out of that active listening phase with targeted stakeholder meetings and evaluation of data before pulling all of that together and publishing a report in May 2021. We felt that it was really important not to rush the active listening phase. We knew we needed to build trust where it was lacking and we needed to make sure that we were enabling meaningful discussion in a safe environment. We're also aware that there was skepticism about the outcome of the review and the likelihood of it making any material difference or extending beyond the review period. People said that attention would drift and actions would be suggesting without, suggested without the commitment to see them through. So there was a lot riding on us getting it right, on being inclusive throughout the review process, and also on not shying away from having some really difficult conversations. The active listening phase of the re review highlighted some really interesting things. So it highlighted the value placed on sense of belonging, the negative impact of subtle patterns of racial bias that I've described from my own experience, a lack of confidence in the university dealing appropriately with those incidents, a general lack of racial literacy, the fact that anti-racist work falls disproportionately to people of colour, and the importance of collective responsibility for equality, diversity, inclusion within the university. And more broadly, we learned that there was motivation and commitment to engage with self-education and anti-racist work. But at the same time, there was real anxiety around lack of cultural knowledge and a lack of confidence and understanding about the positive actions that could be taken at an individual level. One of the most frequent comments was that specific training and resources would be really important in taking us forward from the conversations that were initiated and turning discussion into action. And the review at that stage was beginning to emerge as four themes, representation, student experience and attainment, staff experience and progression and culture. And the recommendations were also structured around those four themes. We're in the implementation phase now with a detailed action plan. And we've committed to making significant progress against all 20 recommendations by the autumn of 2023. So I'll just give you a few examples of some of the things that we're doing to implement the recommendations. We're altering the language and tone of our recruitment material, making it clear that we want to improve diversity and broadening our recruitment channels to support a more diverse applicant pool. It's already worked really well in the recruitment of lay members of our governing body, and we want to learn from that and apply it across the board. And I spoke earlier about the awarding gap. So one of our recommendations is to consolidate our access and participation plan and to narrow the gap to 5% by establishing an award and gap steering group with representatives from every school across the university. There is a lot of variation in the award and gap between disciplines. So it's really important to embed that local ownership, self-reflection and analysis of the possible sources of the bias. We're revising our mandatory diversity inclusion training to include a specific element on race equality, but we're also piloting allyship training and some advanced anti-racist training for those who want it, which we're hoping to roll out next year. 
on promotion, we're evaluating all stages of our promotion process. We want to see whether the process is fair and transparent, and hopefully it will enable us to understand, for example, whether ethnically diverse colleagues are not being promoted because they're less likely to have held a leadership role. And once we understand the reasons, we have a chance of doing something about it. And on culture, our goal is a shared understanding and willingness to take responsibility for self-education and action. Unlike private organisations, universities tend not to routinely use values-based assessments in the recruitment of staff. And my view is that if we don't regard an individual's commitment to equality as important when we employ them, how can we just expect it to materialise at an organisational level? So why not ask about their values at interview, ask them about how they've contributed to equality and inclusivity in a previous role. And in exactly the same way, I think that every individual in an organisation should be expected to contribute to a culture of inclusivity. And perhaps that that should be a requirement as part of the citizenship criteria that they need for promotion to demonstrate how they've contributed, for example, to an Athena Swan Action Plan or a race equality plan or contributed to equality and diversity in some other way. And I say that as if it's easy, but of course it's not. I think it's gonna be one of the hardest recommendations to implement because it's about collective responsibility. And that is really hard to achieve at an organizational level. This is a roadmap that I like to use when I'm talking about collective responsibility because it breaks it down into steps so that as an individual, you can assess where you are and what you need to do to make a difference. It starts with understanding the goals and vision of your organization and progresses to actively engaging as a mentor or a DNI lead to drive positive change and to begin welcoming ideas that are different from your own and committing to continuous improvement. And this graphic, I think, captures perfectly the journey that an organization needs to make in order to genuinely achieve a culture change in terms of race equality. I'm not sure about the source of this graphic, but it has been used really extensively now to describe how transformation and growth in this area require discomfort and a willingness to make mistakes. We need to create an environment where those who are in the so-called fear zone, who avoid discomfort, avoid people who are not like them, doubt the existence of racism, are encouraged and empowered to listen to others, to educate themselves and to acknowledge that they do have a role to play in anti-racism. And progressing from the fear zone to the learning zone is really dependent on that. And then the next step from that is the growth zone. So where you create and hold space for those who've been marginalized, you say their name because the more you do that, the less foreign it sounds. You speak out when you see racism in action. You advocate for diversity in decision-making. And perhaps most importantly, you don't let mistakes stop you from doing better. Now, a few weeks ago, an article published in The Economist criticized approaches like the one that I've just described, saying that they impose an ideological outlook and arguing that an inclusive, an inclusive environment results in silencing anyone who doesn't accept the required notion of equality and justice. It claimed that the equality charters have started to introduce a form of institutional thought policing. And it said that committing staff and students to specific views on race, gender and equality, or at least speaking and acting as if they do, goes against the duty of universities to uphold freedom of speech. So what do we make of this? Well, my initial reaction was that it was the Culture Wars Brigade having a go at equality charters and the EDI work that we do in universities. But I do think there's actually something in this article that is worth thinking about. And it must be the case, mustn't it, that the emphasis is on open dialogue, self-education and a consultative approach. As if we start insisting that everyone takes a training programme, whether they like it or not, or imposing a particular curriculum format, or saying that we only want people to think in a certain way, wouldn't we be suppressing diversity of thought? And I can give you a real example of this. I have a colleague who I work really closely with who doesn't accept the concept of white privilege. He's white working class. He simply doesn't accept the idea that if he'd been born black, he would have been significantly more disadvantaged than he was. 
We argue about it a lot, but he is a great colleague. And I'm actually glad that he feels that he can be honest about his views, because as long as we're able to talk about it, there's a chance that I'll be able to convince him one day. But if he were to apply for a job, and let's say he would ask questions around racial, racial literacy, for example, and his views on racism at an interview, what would happen if he expressed his honest views? What if he was turned down for a job because he held that view? Wouldn't that be totally wrong? And I wouldn't want to be working in an environment where everyone was expected to think the same, as well as being unhealthy. It goes against freedom of speech. I do want to finish with something positive though, and this is one of my favorite examples of the power of diversity. It's the story of Bletchley Park, an English country house quite near to Milton Keynes with a hodgepodge of little huts all around its estate. And if you've seen the film Imitation Game, you'll know that it was the secret center of allied code breaking during the Second World War. The team of code breakers were recruited in secret. So for example, by running cryptic crossword competitions in newspapers. They needed people who had mathematical minds, who were good at solving puzzles, good at solving puzzles, uh, but above all were absolutely trustworthy. And not surprisingly, they ended up with a very eclectic mix of people. About three quarters were women, many with background in languages. And there's pretty good evidence that, there, that the code breaking work at Bletchley Park shortened the war by somewhere between two and four years. Now, just as important as what was achieved at Bletchley Park was the way it was done. And if you visit Bletchley Park, you might see a plaque just inside the entrance near the gift shop. And it says this, Bletchley Park was a melting pot of brilliant minds set free by an atmosphere of tolerance. Societal norms were swept aside. What mattered was what people could do, not their gender, sexuality, religion, or any supposed eccentricity. By removing those artificial constraints, Bletchley Park brought out the best in the fullest range of talent. In this sense, Bletchley's code-breaking success came not in spite of people's differences, but because of them. It's a compelling model for the power of diversity that resonates more than ever today. So I'll finish with that, an inspiring blueprint for us all. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, it's what you do that matters. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Parvin, for an excellent, open, insightful, and inspirational uh, talk on this, this important topic. Uh, your achievements have been amazing, and you're indeed a role model for many of us to follow. Thank you. So we'll now uh, have questions from the panelists that will include some sent by the participants. And I'll start with the, the first question. I was particularly impressed by the race equality review that University of Reading had uh, carried out. And of course, that has led to some important action plans and obviously more opportunities. So my question is that sometimes a lack of confidence and full knowledge of procedures to the, together with some cultural aspects. Uh, for example, uh, the, often the first generation immigrants tell their children to accept everything, not to challenge in fear that such actions may backfire. And of course, this thought process then actually sort of gets passed into sort of the generations. Uh, this could, of course, represent some of the major hurdles on uh, BAM individuals not capitalizing on opportunities that arise. So what can universities uh, and also what can BAM individuals uh, that are in senior positions do to encourage and set up initiatives uh, to, uh, so that such hurdles are overcome? That's a really good question, Deepak. And at the start of, of our race equality review, I made a conscious decision that I would speak openly about my lived experience as I have done today and not treat this as just another project. I could have done it that way. I could have just launched the project and not, not shared any personal experiences. I felt that that was important because it was important for people to see that this is everyday lived experience for many of us. And in doing so, I think it also empowered people, other people from ethnic minorities across the university to, um, to feel that they have the confidence to speak up themselves. That was really important. And, and I've heard, so we have a leadership group which consists of heads of schools and heads of function. I've spoken to them directly also about my lived experience and I've heard them reflecting that to their teams. So I think it's really important for senior leadership 
to be honest, confident and upfront about the issues. Um, but I think at the same time, it's really important not to offload all of the burden of work on people from ethnic minorities and to make it clear that you expect the whole organization to take part in anti-racist work. And one way that we've been doing that is to try to strengthen our allyship program. So we have an allies network alongside our uh, BAME network. And there's still more work to do there, I think, but it's, it's and, and we're also thinking of launch, we're also planning to launch allyship training for people to understand that allyship is an active thing. It's not just saying, yes, I agree with this. It's actually being prepared to stand up and do some of the anti-racist work. So I think that's also an important element of implementing the recommendations. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll now pass it to Jim Murray for the next question. Thanks. It's, it's really exciting to, to listen to, to you talk. And I think if I could just you know, give my own ref reflection, which is that you know, just listening to people is so important and understanding their lived experiences. It's, it's all part of understanding each other and, and, and our diversity. I guess from a head of school perspective, trying to, to think about how we tackle some of these issues, that one of the dangers is the equivalent of greenwashing where we are kind of put in place policies that appear to be addressing the issues. But I wonder sometimes whether they really are tackling the, the, the number of the issues. And I suppose, you know, coming to a more specific question, I mean, do you, how, how helpful do you think targets are? Um, it, you know, is it, are targets useful or are they actually an admission of, of failure? And, and uh, yeah, how do they fit into that sort of overall picture of the danger of kind of lip service to the issue? That's, that's also a very good question. Targets is one of the things that I most often have an argument with, uh, argument about with my uh, Dean for Diversity and Inclusion who I line manage, because I, I instinctively don't like them. I instinctively don't like putting a number on something and then saying, well, we haven't reached it because that's normally what happens, particularly with race equality targets. Um, and we do have targets. In fact, we've just reset our targets. And when we reset them this time, I was really robust in asking about the justification behind them. And they were, to be fair, created consultatively. So there was wide consultation about the targets. My view is that numbers don't help me um, in general. In my mind, I think there are three key things that we can do. And, and, and the three key things, are, so number one is make the top more like the bottom. I mean, that, that's a sort of target, but it's expressing it very simply to say, what does your organization look like? And maybe not, maybe you don't look at the whole organization, maybe you look at academics and, and different groups separately, but, uh, but how different is the top from the bottom and why is it different and what are you doing to redress that balance? That's the first thing. It's a sort of target, but I prefer to think about it holistically like that rather than try to put a number on it. The second thing, second target I think is to champion allyship and what does your allyship look like? And that's also not a number, it's something much more qualitative. And the third thing is about collective responsibility. And you could try and put a number on it and say, you know, to what proportion of individuals in my organization are contributing in a meaningful way to equality, diversity and inclusion. But again, I like to look at that qualitatively. So for me, those are the key things. And I think we can just get distracted by talking endlessly about numbers and forgetting what it is we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the numbers should become a measure of the other things we're doing yeah. rather than something we're trying to yes. deliberately, well, target for a target sounds a bit, uh, That's <laughs> a bit silly. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's a measure rather than, a, rather than something we're aiming to do specifically. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Jim. Uh, Daniela, your, your question. Um, thanks, Parveen, for such a personal and powerful presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, as somebody who's interested in looking at the BAME attainment gap, we now know the government is modifying access to loan criteria, et cetera. And even though it's very clear that people that would not be eligible for loan now uh, manage to graduate with 40% of these people with a 2-1 or a first class. So how do we address these issues and how do we bring people in? Because I think one of the issues is we don't get enough students, so certainly in the subjects like biomedical sciences, 
we don't have a sufficient number of students to begin with, to work with so that they can progress further in their, in their academic uh, careers. So, so is the question about um, improving the attainment gap? It is, but also it's about, uh, first of all, what can we do to counter, if you like, some of the changes that are taking place that will reduce access because of the reduction in the number of loan access for some of the students, I right? yeah. minorities. And at the same time, what can we do to ensure that the degree per step is also important and people see the value of engaging with such disciplines. Yeah, I mean, I think I think a lot of universities are now reviewing their access and participation plans, aren't they? Because of the uh, because of um, I think it's John Blake who has just taken up his position. Um, I mean, it's not an area that I work in directly, but it does really concern me that a lot of the things that the government are talking about, you know, um, minimum entry criteria and so on, are just going to make things harder and harder um, uh, for ethnically diverse applicants. Um, you know, I guess the, the traditional answer would be to keep putting pressure on, but uh, at the moment it's just not being heard, is it? So yeah, that's something that I'm, it just really frustrates me at the moment. Thanks, Daniela. Numer, your question. Um, well, I, I, I just, I just wanted to start by echoing everything that the panelists said. That that was an incredibly inspiring talk, um, especially as an early career researcher and someone who was born in Pakistan and has been through the asylum process. At, at the uh, the uh, to, to someone who is not only an ethnic minority but also LGBTQ plus. So. I sort of had that that intersectional challenge, which I which I face at a at a personal level. But at the at the same time, I always ask myself, as as indeed I, I imagine lots of people will today, when when um, after they've heard your talk, is how how can we help? And that includes me as a as someone who is intersectional. And I try to address the, the these issues at a community level, not just at an academic level, because at some point we are out there in the community. And I, and I wonder, and this is a statement and it's also a question because a lot of the times by, by the time people enter university doors, they're sort of crystallized as who they are. I'm not saying change is impossible, yeah. I'm saying it's challenging. Um, and, and I wonder if more academics need to be out there in the community, whether you're an early career researcher, whether you are senior in your role and that's how I try to address this issue is be out there in the community because of course a lot uh, of uh, academics are asylum seekers are refugees like myself and many of them not don't just face hurdles uh, at an academic level but for example at an immigration level and and do you think universities need to be doing more in terms of making public statements that state for instance when it comes to immigration policies we need to be doing more um, to reduce the, the legislative challenges that international students face, for instance, or, or, or international people in, in general who are also within the higher education institutions. Hopefully, hopefully that... Hopefully yeah, that, that completely makes sense. And actually, during the active listening phase, we did get feedback from um, international students and staff who had come to work in, in the UK along those lines. I think your point about reaching out to the community is a really good one. Um, and again, during the active listening phase of the review, we had at least one, if not more, events that were um, that were sort of joint, jointly held with, with the community. And I've, I've noticed that Alice Mapofu Coles, who is um, an amazing um, community lead within our university just finished her PhD but also a local councillor is really um, paving the way for us to have better engagement with the community we weren't doing that particularly well before and it is bringing benefits that we're starting to see in terms of equality diversity and inclusion and I think we've got a lot to gain and a lot to learn actually from interacting with the community in the way that you've suggested it's easier for some communities than others isn't it because it really depends on where you are regionally I mean we're quite we're quite fortunate in that we do have quite a diverse local population not all universities are 
are in that position. But I think where you are in that position, there's a lot to be gained from it. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Parvin. Thank you, Numer. Uh, we've got a question on, in the chat from uh, Afshan Malik uh, from uh, uh, King's College London. Uh, do you have plans to offer easily accessible support to ethnic minority staff who feel they have been treated unfairly by the academic system, for example, in being considered for promotion or leadership roles? So in the first instance, we don't have very good data at all about how fair our promotion process is in terms of ethnic background. And the reason for that is that numbers are so small that you can't disaggregate them. I know this is a common problem. And it's something that really frustrates people who say they want evidence that the process is fair and unbiased. And so what we're trying to do at the moment is to get um, some, uh, some external observation of our whole promotions process. So some, somebody to come in, to listen to the conversations that are being had, to look at the paperwork and, um, and to come back with an evaluation of the process. Are, are the cases that are successful? So is there something about the cases that are successful that are different from the ones that fail that might be linked with um, ethnic diversity? Is it uh, the case, for example, that if you're from an ethnic minority, you will have had um, fewer opportunities to take on leadership roles and therefore when you come to applying for promotion, you don't have that evidence. Um, I think we need to do that. So it's qualitative analysis rather than quantitative because because not, not having the numbers is not an excuse for not exploring this question. So I think that's the first step. Um, I think another relevant point is that we found that where, where incidences have happened, and that might be related to promotion, but it might be related to something else, might be microaggressions and so on, there's only one process to raise a complaint, and that's through the grievance process, which... I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it never produces a good outcome for anybody, is my um, experience. And, I, and we're, we're looking at that grievance process and whether there is something better that's more like mediation in the case where there has been an incident um, that isn't, isn't racial harassment, but it's an incident that needs to be addressed and some action needs to be taken. So I think you know there, there are several parts to that. Thank you. And, uh... The next question is from Sarju Patel from the School of Medicine here. How do you address individuals who do not accept your lived experience has affected the way you interpret events? Well, I guess that, I guess a good example is the one that I gave about the colleague who, um, who says that he doesn't accept the concept of white privilege. And to me, my definition of white privilege is um, that if you've never come away from a conversation or an experience that's made you question whether you were treated that way or spoken to in that way because of your skin color, that's the definition of, of white privilege for me because that happens to me quite often. And I think if you're white, you will never have experienced that. You will never come away from a conversation and think, was I treated like that because of my skin color? Um, so, I mean, people can have their own interpretations, but I guess at the same time, you, you have to be aware that not everybody is going to have the same interpretation as you. It doesn't stop me from speaking out. That's good, thank you. Uh, do you know of any other universities which have sort of been proactive in, in this aspect, uh, like, like University of, of Reading in carrying out the race equality review in the UK? Well, I guess you can look at all of the universities that have got a race equality charter mark. So there, I don't think anyone has a silver um, award, as far as I know. And there are a good number now that have a bronze award. We're actually in the process of compiling an application for a race equality charter mark that we're going to submit in July. Um, it's not a huge number. There are more universities that have signed up to the race equality charter but haven't put in for an award yet so i guess those are the ones to look at um, you know king's college have done a lot in terms of race equality they've worked they're working really hard on their um, awarding gap so yeah that that would be something to have a look at again i think you you would do that um, i the, the, the charters play an important role because they focus your mind 
But my view is that whether you have a charter mark or not, it doesn't necessarily, um, it's not necessarily an indication of how serious you are about your anti-racist work. Thank you. Any, uh, Jim? Could I just come back on the, on the previous questions about, about promotion? Because one of the things that concerns me is, is not only about the uh, fairness of the process once some, somebody's in it, but also that various um, sorts of minorities may feel less empowered, less entitled to actually apply for promotion right. or put themselves forward. Yeah. And it's, and it's um, whether you've had any thoughts as, about how best to deal with that yeah. issue. We actually, we kind of tackled that um, from the Athena Swan gender equality perspective some years ago. So we have a two stage process for promotion now where um, at school level, there's a meeting that involves some people external to the school and the head of school is required to go through the entire list of staff. And, and for each member of staff, there has to be a discussion about whether they should be encouraged to apply for promotion or not. And if not, there needs to be a reason for it. And if so, there needs to be a reason for it. And that, that in itself has resulted in more women being promoted to professor quite significantly. So it's definitely worked in terms of gender equality. And I guess that doesn't guarantee that those conversations are going to be fair, transparent, but that's where some external observation of the conversations that are had um, would be useful. So I think, I think we, we do have tools that we can use because those people are then approached and offered a mentor to work with them on their promotion case. And, and, it, and it's done in a transparent way with people that are external to the school who can challenge if they don't hear, if they don't think they're hearing things that are fair. That's very interesting, thank you. Uh, I, I think that's, I, I think proactivity, as you mentioned, and engagement with staff in terms of promotion is an excellent idea, I think, which, which uh, uh, a lot of schools should try and incorporate. Any other questions from, from the panelists? Uh, Numer? I, I just had one last question, and I, I'm not sure that the answer will be an easy one. Uh, it sort of links back to, to my, my statement earlier on that a lot of people who, who come through university doors probably have preconceived notions and it might be challenging for them to change. Do you feel as if more, more academics at a higher education in, 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 in HE have to address this at a primary level, almost reach out uh, to schools and, and do more outreach stuff? Um, because I, I firmly believe, having spoken to a lot of, a lot of community level, a, 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 to having spoken to a lot of communities that change has to happen at a primary level yeah. so not not just address it at a higher education level but at a sort of primary level yeah i think actually that's a really good point and um it's only recently that i've had the opportunity to go into schools and to talk to um i guess uh, school kids from about year nine up and I was taken aback at how transformative that was. And I hadn't realized that many school children haven't had conversations like that, but that um, head teachers in particular are beginning to realize how important this is. And that's particularly the case at the moment where we've had a couple of unusual years, unusual kind of social environment for children. And and, and, and children are talking about equality, diversity, inclusion, because of course the, the Black Lives Matter movement began during the pandemic and we're still sort of seeing some of that uh, playing out. So I, I think it is really important and yeah, I think we should be doing more of it. Well, thank, thank you, Parvin. Uh, any, any more questions? Uh, Daniela. It's also about the criteria that we use for promoting or excel, the way we assess excellence. So should we be more inclusive and broaden our criteria for our students from an educational standpoint, but also later on in academic staff, career progression? Yeah, we've, I mean, we've re-looked at our criteria several times. And at the moment, we have not just uh, research led criteria and teaching led criteria, but we have uh, three categories of citizenship criteria. 
um, I'm pushing for a little bit more in terms of equality, diversity, inclusion, but maybe some other things. So I'm, what I'm not saying is that every single person has to do some equality work, but it could be that one of our citizenship criteria is about a contribution to EDI or sustainability or community work or uh, something around um, working with schools that Numed just mentioned. So that, that's something that I would like to see coming out of one of the recommendations of our race equality review that citizenship should really be that, that you're contributing to creating um, a positive workplace, a positive culture. Thank, thank, thank you, Parvin, uh, for an insightful and inspiring talk. And we learned so much today. Uh, and obviously some of the points that uh, you raised, in fact, uh, action plans from University of Reading uh, could be widely incorporated in other universities as well. So it's really a, a great way going forward uh, thank you for uh, sort of uh, going through your life journey uh, and also, in fact, uh, these sort of activities that you've carried out. Uh, so we, we conclude this, uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, I would also like to thank the panelists for their excellent contributions today and to all the uh, audience for joining us in this important discussions. Now, this talk has been recorded and will be made av available on our rest equality web pages and details of the next talk in the series will be also be displayed there. So thank you to all of you uh, for, uh, for joining this, this important discussion. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Bavin. It's been really stimulating, interesting, and indeed exciting, I think, Al, so thank you.